Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to lesson number 11. This one's going to be on the topic of normalization, which I hinted at in the last lesson, number 10. And uh, this one's going to be a, a little bit of a longer video just because there's a lot to cover uh, with respect to normalization. So strap yourselves in, get your notebooks ready, let's rock. So today, what you're going to learn, it looks like it's a, a measly little bit of, uh, of stuff. It's only three points, but like I said, it's going to be a long lesson. So uh, you're going to learn about what anomalies are in a database and why they are bad things. Uh, we're going to learn about some tactics that are used to ensure that we keep the anomalies out of our database. Okay, And we're also going to learn a little bit about how to design our databases so they are as rock solid as possible. So this is going to be really, really, really useful stuff. Um, you're probably going to want to come back to this video a fair bit to sort of refresh your knowledge on all of these topics. Okay, so let's get right into it. So what is normalization? Well, normalizing a database is actually the act of uh, breaking big tables into smaller ones to reduce anomalies. So what I mean by a big table is a table that has lots and lots of columns in it. So lots and lots of, you know, different columns, and lots and lots of different, you know, data types, etc, etc. And it's a process of taking that big table and breaking it down into smaller ones based on a set of rules. And these are the rules that we're going to be talking about today. So breaking big tables into smaller ones is normalization. Now, obviously, the point of it is to reduce anomalies and anomalies come in three different forms. Insertion anomalies, update anomalies and deletion anomalies. Now, obviously, anomalies are not our friend, and this is why the concept of normalization was actually created. So let's look at uh, a table that is the opposite of normalized, that's what we call denormalized. Uh, denormalized, okay? So um, these are, so this is a table that we've sort of uh, created, a table design. Uh, so this is the outline, the schema, if you will. We have a uh, primary key here of student ID, and then we have student name, student address, and the class that the student is enrolled in. Okay, and we have some example data here that shows sort of what the table would look like. So we have our student ID, name, address, and class that's a, that they are enrolled in. So we have, uh, you know, Trevor Page, uh, John Doe, Jack Johnson, you can get the idea where they live. So I, in the student address, I just abbreviate it to be just the city for now. Um, we'll be expanding on this later. And then the actual class that they are enrolled in. So the student table is not normalized and therefore will be subject to anomalies. Now, you probably don't understand why it is not normalized, but don't worry, we're going to be getting into that. All I want you to, to realize is that with the table as it currently is, uh, is um, created and designed, uh, in insertion anomalies will occur. So they will occur if, let's say, a new student is created but hasn't yet enrolled uh, themselves into a class. So it says the class enrolled, so this is this one over here, this column, uh, will have a null value. And it's not good to have nulls in a database. That means you're wasting space. Um, that is obviously not a good thing. So that could be an insertion anomaly, meaning... Um, uh, because there is, let's say we have a new a student that joins, uh, let's say Jane Doe joins up. So Jane Doe will be number six. So she'll be Jane Doe. Let's say she lives in, oh, who knows? Let's say she lives in Sydney. She's from Australia and uh, she's not enrolled in any classes. So this is an insertion anomaly because we're inserting a row in here, but the row is not complete. Okay, so we'll have a null value in the class enrolled. So it's kind of odd because this is a student table. Right, so it should be tracking the information about the student, uh, but not necessarily what classes they are enrolled in. That doesn't necessarily fit perfectly into what a student um, table should look like. So that's why you're going to have an insertion anomaly uh, because that student hasn't yet enrolled in anything. Okay, um, an update anomaly will occur if you want to change, let's say, my address, so the address of Trevor Page. Um, if you want to change his address, we're going to need to make the change in two different places. So I have a row here um, with Trevor Page in the student name, as well as a row here um, with Trevor Page as a student name, and they both are in Toronto, but I'm going to have to update the address, so I have to update it in two different places. And the reason why Trevor Page appears twice is because he's enrolled in computer science as well as math. Okay, that's why there's two different entries for the same person with the same address. So an update anomaly will occur because, like I said, if you want to change the address here for Trevor Page, we need to do it in two places. And that just doesn't make sense um, that eventually something's going to go wrong and you might be in a situation where, um, you know, one address says Toronto and the other one says, well, maybe Sydney. Okay, so that that's not a good thing. You don't want to be in the situation where you could have um, update anomalies. 
Now, finally, you can also have deletion anomalies that could occur if we say deregister someone from a class. So let's say if you want to deregister, uh, you know, this fifth row, Trevor Page, from the math class, we would just delete the row, right? So we delete the row. Now math is no longer in there, so he's no longer enrolled in that class, um, and, and that looks like it'll be fine. However, if you also de-enroll, let's say, Jack Johnson from music, what happens to Jack Johnson? Well, we need to de-enroll him from music, which means we delete the row. But now, if we delete the row, Jack Johnson no longer exists as a student. So that's an unintended side effect that is called a deletion anomaly. Because when we de-enroll him from music, we don't want to delete his entire student record. That's just silly. So that is, like I said, a deletion anomaly. So all of these are occurring because we have a denormalized table. Once we make this student table a more normalized table, which means, like I remember from what I said before, normalization is a process of taking a big table and breaking it into smaller tables. Um, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be taking this student table and breaking it up into smaller, uh, well, more tables, not necessarily smaller, but just more tables. So, okay, so normalization, like I said, fixes anomaly. But normalization, let's get into that a little bit more, it comes in many forms. Uh, specifically, the, the most common forms are uh, these four here. So first normal form, second normal form, third normal form, and something called the Boyce-Codd normal form, which can be abbreviated to BCNF or 3.5 NF. Okay, NF standing for normal form. So you see 1NF, 2NF, 3NF, those are all the abbreviations for first, second, and third normal forms. Um, now, each normal form becomes more and more strict, okay, meaning that first normal form, 1NF, is the least strict. And as we move down this sort of um, number of normal forms, as we move down to the bottom, uh, it becomes the more and more strict. So the most strict is the BCNF, the Boyce Cod normal form. Okay. However, just to, to you know be complete about this, once you reach the third normal form, your database should and will most likely be free from all anomalies. So typically, uh, what we do is typically we we uh, normalize a database to the third normal form, and we typically stop there because getting to that last normal form here can get pretty tricky. Um, BCNF, so Boyce Cod normal form, this last one was created to address a very complex scenario uh, which could cause anomalies. Okay, that's going to be sort of outside of the scope of this course because I've never had to normalize a table to, to Boyce Cod normal form um, in my professional career or my normal career as a uh, as a programmer here doing side stuff and uh, and teaching. So I've never had to do that before. So I think it might be a bit of a waste of time to teach you that, um, and it might just confuse you. So I think once you get a hang of normalization, um, and if you are really uh, you know dying to know more about the BCNF Boyce Cod normal form, but then by all means you can go and study it yourself. I'm sure you'll get a good grasp on it um, by going through all the online uh, documentation on it because there are plenty of articles that explain it. So having said that, let's jump into the least strict uh, of the normal forms, which is the first normal form and understand the rules that govern uh, whether a table is in first uh, 1NF or not. Okay, so these are the rules. So to be in first normal form, every row must be unique. So you're familiar with this already. We've talked about the concept of, um, you know, the most important thing that we need to make sure of in our tables that they every single row is unique. That is a property of databases. That is a property of the first normal form. Okay, you need to have this in order to have any sort of good uh, database design whatsoever. Also, to uh, achieve first normal form, you need to make sure that every cell is free from something called groups. Now, like I explained, the first condition is pretty simple to achieve because we've talked about this already. Um, all you need to do is add an auto-incrementing primary key into your table and you are set. So that doesn't come as any shock or surprise. We've talked about uh, primary keys before and this is why we use them to make sure that every row is unique. Now, as for the second condition, uh, this is a bit more confusing. What are these groups that, that we're talking about here? Every cell must be free from groups. What does that mean? Well, a group is when you have more than one piece of data in a single cell. So, for example, if I were to rewrite my database from before, this is what I, it would look like if I had groups. So, if I had, um, in the classes enrolled, I had computer science, comma, math, comma, astronomy and math comma history. These two rows are bad. They break first normal form because you're not allowed to have multiple data points inside of a single cell of data. This is a single cell here, these these areas, right? Um, so the, this is not good. This is this breaks first normal form. So in order to fix this, so given that this table is not normalized, how can we fix it? Each row 
is already unique because of the student ID. Okay, so that's already good. If you didn't already have the student ID, then you would need to add the student ID uh, to, to uh, make sure that it um, uh, achieves that first rule of the first normal form. But we, since we have groups, we need to eliminate them. So how do we do that? Well, let's take the table from above and let's uh, recreate it by getting rid of the groups. So this is what this would look like. This would turn into um, three different rows for Trevor Page where each row is unique in terms of it has a different class enrolled um, entry, right? So we have Trevor Page Computer Science, Trevor Page Math, and Trevor Page Astronomy. Um, now, we have repeating primary keys here, so you see 1, 1, 1 is not actually a good thing at all. Um, and if this was set as a primary key, it actually would not, uh, this would not allow you to do this uh, particular setup. You're not allowed to have duplicating primary keys. So I suppose in this particular example, this student ID would not be set up as a primary key. It would just be set up as another column in the database. But each row is unique. So although we have repeating uh, data here in these three uh, different rows, these three uh, entries here in the class enrolled are all unique. Therefore, each of these rows is unique because they are, are uh, differentiated by the class that is, uh, that is enrolled in, that this person is enrolled in, right? Same with John Doe. There's two repeating rows, but we have math and history. Uh, so it's not actually a full repeating row. It's just the, um, the last piece of data that will uh, be different. And then all the rest of the rows are unique all on their own. Now, this is still not a great design, but it does adhere to the first normal form rules, okay? But like I said, this is the least strict in terms of the normal forms. All right, so that does it for the uh, first normal form. So now let's move on to the next lesson where we're going to learn about the, uh, the remaining normal forms and how you can use them to build yourself a rock-solid database design. So I'll see you in the next lesson. Bye for now.